Dear Professor Matsukato, good morning. My name morning. is Saravia Matus, and I am the Economic Affairs Officer in charge of water issues at ECLAC, and it is a great honor to be here with you today. We thank you for granting us this interview for the opening of the third edition of the Regional Water Dialogues of Latin America and the Caribbean, which are held in preparation for the upcoming UN Water Conference. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. Today's interview consists of four key questions. Let's begin. At ECLAC, we are proposing that countries in our region embrace a water management transition that is both inclusive and sustainable to achieve the following. One, to close the water, sanitation, and hygiene infrastructure gap, therefore guaranteeing this important human right. Two, to update tariff systems to make them more efficient, inclusive, and progressive. Three, to reduce negative externalities related to overexploitation, pollution, and conflict. And four, to adopt circular water systems in productive activities that depend strategically on water, agriculture, mining, etc. The challenges to reaching these goals are multidimensional and require multi-stakeholder approach. What would be your recommendation to create momentum and embrace this transition in the coming years in the region? Do you do you have any insights from your recent work as co-chair of the Global Commission on the Economics of Water? Right, so, well, thank you so much. Um, one of the main insights in the Global Water Commission that I co-chair is that you know, we have failed, not by chance, but because of how we've actually thought about the role of policy. At best, we think about it as you know, fixing different types of market failures, and we talk about public-private relationships to solve the grand challenges of our time without actually paying attention to the design of those relationships and how they can actually create not only an investment trajectory towards the solutions, but also really take care to make sure that we embed justice, equity, and inclusion and co-creation at the center. And you know, to close the water, sanitation, and hygiene infrastructure gap, of course, we need lots of public and private investment. Currently, that investment is mainly focused on about 10% of the hydrological cycle. So basically what's often called blue water, leaving out something like 60% of what's called green water into their assessments. Um, and what we think is that in order to tackle both the blue water issue and the green water issue, we really need to think of the systemic properties of our economy. And in order to do so, we need not only systems analysis, but as I was talking before, in order to really rethink the underlying economics, we need to think about a market shaping and a market creation approach. Um, and what does that mean? It means that the, the kind of objectives that we're going after should be just that, objectives and not corrections. It shouldn't be either philanthropy or the state coming in to solve a problem ex post, what we really need to do is be designing the interrelationships between public, private, and civil society actors in a pre-distributive way. So from the beginning, designed in such a way that actually allows us to achieve the goals that we're after. And for this, um, I've been reflecting quite a bit on why it is that we're stuck. And you know, I, I, I mentioned before the public good problem and the reason the public good problem is a problem is that again it, it's seen as a correction something that the public sector needs to invest in because the private sector is not investing in it so i've been advocating for a common good approach um, a common good approach which actually puts as much attention on the how as the what so the how meaning how do we actually design intellectual property rights how do we design financial institutions with conditionality at the center? How do we have sharing of knowledge, sharing of technologies through, for example, common pool resources at the center of the design of these relationships that we need in order to turn what is currently really a tragedy in terms of the water problem globally, which you know about more than I, uh, into an opportunity-led solution space? Um, and you know, really what we're thinking about is what this common good approach means for both policy design, institutional design, for example, the design of a public bank for reward sharing. So how do we make sure that the financial tools that we have can actually help share the rewards of collectively created value? 
but also that issue of co-creation and democratic participation. Because water, like with climate and health, it lands in very concrete places. And we need to make sure that the people, especially the most vulnerable people, the communities that are being affected by the problem have a voice, have a voice at the table to help you know, us reimagine what the future might look like. Thank you. In your book, The Entrepreneurial State, Debunking Public versus Private Sector Myth, you explore further the role of the state in promoting investing and innovative solutions. So in the case of water, how could the role of the state be modified to adjust to this vision that you've just shared with us in order to address these water challenges that are so present in Latin America and in the Caribbean? And if I may add, do we have any advantages in the region that we can tackle and overcome our, grow our growing water challenges by hmm. improving our state? Sure. I mean, first, it's really important to remember that water, in some ways, issues around water uh, go across all the SDGs. Of course, the most obvious one is SDG 6 um, around water and sanitation, but of course, all the ones that have to also do with gender parity, given that it's often women who, you know, late at night or early in the morning have to go fetch water and also uh, rape occurs in many places of the world during this, you know, search for water when women alone are actually having to go get what should be a human right. Of course, it has to do with SDG 14, SDG 13 on, on climate change and so forth. So water is really powerful in terms of thinking about state action, precisely because it's a horizontal area that goes across all the sustainable development goals. And in each one of the sustainable development goals, what I argued in my recent book called Mission Economy, is that you know, we can turn the SDGs, all 17 of them, from just kind of being broad challenges towards really being moonshots. You know, think of, again, SDG six, if we wanted to um, really ensure that everyone in a country has access to clean water and sanitation, what would that look like for all the different sectors and actors in a system? So what's interesting about moonshots, including the one that literally got us to the moon, is it's never about one sector. You know, going to the moon, would not have happened if we just thought about it in terms of aerospace. We also needed electronics, materials, nutrition, software to innovate. And so with SDG 6, of course, it's going to have to do with um, you know, uh, all sorts of changes in the area of, of construction, of materials, of all the social and physical infrastructure, energy, transport, trade, environment, education. Uh, these are all kind of, you know, broadly defined sectors that would have to get involved, but also what's, what's, what's powerful when we think about the entrepreneurial state and mission economy is the need for the state to really transform all its levers, like procurement policy, so the state as purchaser, uh, grants and loans of, as different levers that can help crowd in bottom-up experimentation in the business community and other actors. So again, with SDG 6, you can imagine different projects that could be uh, fruits of innovation, whether it's developing new materials that require less water in the production process. In Latin America, imagine if lithium <laughs> uh, extraction and also moving up the value chain of lithium could actually be using less water, given that, of course, lithium is an opportunity, uh, and as are different resources and natural resources in Latin America, an opportunity for innovation, but not if actually in the process they become part of the problem. Other projects preventing water pollution by increasing the cost of, of harmful activity that, of course, can be thought about in terms of, you know, how do we design a tax system to actually uh, uh, help achieve that. Um, developing water cleaning technologies to increase recycling and reducing the usage of fresh water for agriculture. So, you know, agricultural uh, uh, production, of course, in Latin America is very important, but we need regenerative agriculture and really making sure that we focus on different types of innovations around uh, uh, water to allow that to happen, you know, huge opportunities there, as well as reducing carbon dioxide emissions by developing green and renewable energy across an entire supply chain and the link uh, of, of that also with, with different innovations around water. Anyway, there's, there's, there's all sorts of examples one can give, but really what I'm interested in is how do you design such a process 
And currently the problem is that often when the state gets involved, it's just giving out subsidies and guarantees to existing sectors. It could even be sexy sectors like renewable energy, or it could be mining, you know, it, it, it could be the digital economy, the pharmaceutical industry. In order to achieve um, the solutions towards emissions, what we need is not guarantees and subsidies to sectors, but really clear missions that allow different sectors to work together towards a common goal. And again, using the tools that government has like procurement grants and loans to create conditions attached within those contracts that really foster that kind of social, organizational, and technological innovation that we require. In the same line, at ECLAC, we have estimated that we would need to invest 1.3% of our regional GDP annually over a decade so that we can cl could close the safely managed drinking water and sanitation coverage gap and along the way generate about 3.6 million direct jobs per year. So what do you think could be the initial strategies that we in the country state, the different uh, stakeholders should adopt to ensure this resource mobilization, this grander coordination scheme to get this going? Sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's both a problem of the quantity of finance and the quality of the finance. For the quantity of the finance, it's estimated that an average capital investment of about 114 billion per year is actually required um, to, for us to meet the 2030 uh, goals around water supply, sanitation, and hygiene. And that accounts for about a threefold increase of the current expenditure. So that's a question of the quantity of finance. Um, the quality of the finance matters a lot. We know that, for example, the the finance that has come from um, organizations like the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund um, have in the past also had problematic conditions attached that the countries in question receiving the finance had to promise to you know, reduce their deficits, to cut public expenditure. And you know, no one thinks, or I don't think we should have wasteful public expenditure, but that kind of blanket conditionality has often reduced then the fiscal space of countries at the local, regional, and national level to really actually then act boldly. So really there as well, it's not about the amount of public finance, but how do we actually mobilize and create a fiscal space? And within that uh, ambitions around the tools, I already mentioned some before around procurement and grants and loans that can really also galvanize and catalyze other forms of finance. So in economics, we call it a crowding in effect. And you know, business invests when it sees an opportunity. If, if you just give a tax incentive, which reduces the cost to business, they won't invest in, unless they really see an opportunity for growth, which could be a, a market opportunity, a technological opportunity. So I, I really believe that the strategies that we need today to ensure the resource mobilization that we require are those that increase the expectations across different actors of where future opportunities might lie. And there's just so many opportunities around water. I named some before when I talked about the mission-oriented approach, but it's, it's really about transforming what is currently a challenge and a problem into an opportunity for innovation that in a well-designed way can crowd in and catalyze and have a ripple effect across different actors. But it also means that we need conditionality attached to uh, loan programs. I was very inspired when I saw that in Germany in recent years, they've ended up with the very green steel industry because the local public bank there, the KFW, so the equivalent say of BNDS in, in Brazil, created strong conditions attached for the loans that the steel industry provided. They had to commit to lowering their, car, their material content uh, in order to receive the loan because steel globally is having a problem. And they did so using repurpose, reuse, recycle technology across the entire uh, supply chain of steel. And they did so because they had to in order to get one penny out of the government. And so using these tools like the loans from a development bank, and of course, in Latin America, we have CAF, we have again, BNDS, there's local, regional, national, transnational public banks to really catalyze that kind of investment in the business community but also that dynamic that we might have between different types of public banks when they're working together to foster and catalyze 
the investments that's needed, we really need to think through how we can, not so much through a stick, but through interesting and dynamic conditionality spur as much innovation as we can. For example, lowering the water use of our uh, manufacturing industries. Interesting. And going back to your book, Mission Economy, A Moonshot Guide to Changing Capitalism, I wonder, what strategies have you found that are helpful to promote this kind of coordination within the gov, within the water uh, institutions and water governance that are very peculiar in their own? And also, you have spoken about the relevance of addressing water as a common good and not necessarily a private and or public one. Is this a central piece to the puzzle? Absolutely. Um, you know, the common good, again, requires us to reimagine which future we want to live in. So if we want a more inclusive form of growth, a more sustainable form of growth, that requires very concrete Um, you know, a, a targets that we need to reach across our entire economy, how we produce, how we distribute, and how we consume. And I think that critical to tackling water-related challenges is really the requirement, requirement for a new social contract between business and the state, especially developing a more mutualistic relationship. And in Latin America, but also in my own country, Italy, we often have a rent seeking relationship. We have rents that are distributed in the system between you know, public and private, and it doesn't actually lead to that kind of catalytical effect I was talking about before. So I think the key design challenge is A, how we do we really think about shared goals that maximize public value and the common good? Uh, B, how do we prioritize stakeholder value as part of that process. You know, we can't just have businesses thinking about how to maximize short-term profits and share prices. And in the US, for example, you have many co uh, companies that are just buying back their own shares to boost stock prices, stock options, and executive pay. And, and that's a failure of reinvesting their profits back into production to make it more innovative, sustainable, and inclusive by just kind of financializing those profits. Um, And, and another really important issue is how do we co-invest in the technology, the skills, and the infrastructure we need, but also really pay attention to ownership issues. Uh, we, we've seen in the energy sector that, that you know, what looks like a socialization of risk often turns into a privatization of rewards. So we need to rediscover also cooperative models, mutual, you know, mutualistic models, but really that issue of sharing, you know, sharing of both the risks and the rewards, which We saw with COVID-19 how important this was. We had lots of public and private actors making, for example, um, vaccines, but the vaccine itself was not the mission. The mission was really to vaccinate the world. Otherwise, with a global pandemic like COVID, if a large part of the world remains unvaccinated, the virus comes back and, and bites us. Um, so even for opportunistic reasons, we should have you know, realized that. But what we found was that If you look at the different companies involved, like AstraZeneca, Pfizer, Johnson and Johnson, Moderna, they actually had a different relationship with the public entities that they were working with. And we need to learn which were the good examples, which were the bad examples. And I, I believe that, for example, the AstraZeneca vaccine, which was developed with the help of government investments in R&D, manufacturing, advanced sales, which included provisions to keep um, prices low from the government, Were, were quite interesting precisely because there was conditions attached. Conditions attached, again, to both the prices, but also the knowledge sharing. AstraZeneca, unlike Pfizer, agreed to sharing in the underlying knowledge for the diagnostics, the tools, and the vaccine development. And that kind of condition was actually set by the researchers at Oxford University, paid for by the state. So that would be a good example where in a pre-distributive, ex-ante kind of way, the way that innovation and production was structured between public and private reflected that common good kind of outcome, which was eventually to share the knowledge so the vaccines could also be produced in um, the global south. Um, and you know, there, there, there's all sorts of very problematic examples of, around water where this doesn't happen. For example, in England, since the privatization of the water industry in 1989, an estimated 72 billion uh, pounds have been allowed to leak from the industry 
simply into dividend payouts. And last year, just nine CEOs of English water companies received 15 million pounds in payouts, an increase in 27% from the previous year, while the country's water industry was actually plagued with water leaks and sewage discharge due to outdated infrastructure, which the industry was not investing in, coming back to my point about financialization. So really the point is, is to go beyond this kind of blah, 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 you know, public private partnership business and the state working together, we need to ask how. And this is where the common good setting is important. The how needs to foster collective intelligence. It needs to foster a more inclusive and sustainable form of economy, which is also um, an innovative economy where we have industry actually investing and reinvesting and not uh, you know, being succumbed to the, the financialization trends that uh, I just gave examples of. One of the expected outcomes of the third edition of the Regional Water Dialogue is to collectively adopt a regional water action agenda endorsed by public, private, and the civil society representatives. What do you think should be the key components or commitments of this agenda? And what aspects should be prioritized in this regional roadmap to achieving SDG six or our moonshot of a uh, water management sensation for Latin America and the Caribbean? So I recently presented in Buenos Aires a report I wrote for the UN Economics Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, precisely on how powerful this idea of a challenge-oriented, mission-oriented approach could be for industrial and innovation strategy in the region. And really the idea there is to use the opportunity of the kind of missions approach, which I described before, to really foster a, 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 a investment in innovation across sectors and really also to strengthen the civil service itself um, to think through all those different levers that are available. I've mentioned procurement. Procurement should be outcomes oriented. I've mentioned public private relationships with conditionality at the center. I've mentioned the need for public banks, which don't just give out money, but have conditions attached to make sure that in exchange for a public subsidy, a public grant, a public loan, we have a business investment towards a strategic objective like carbon neutrality, reducing the digital divide, stronger health systems, and so on. So SDG 6 around clean water and sanitation just really presents all sorts of different possibilities um, that underlie you know, the complexity of our water uh, challenges. And, but, but, but key there is really rethinking you know, not just the design of a policy, but what is the way that we can rethink almost the role of the civil service and the state in the process? And so a state that actually provides a direction through a mission-oriented program, but leaves open the how, so you don't micromanage business because that could stifle innovation. So having a portfolio mindset um, where different types of companies are supported, not just one that lobbies its way up, not just one industry, but really a portfolio across a risk space, which um, might provide some guarantees to business, but also that takes care to make sure that if things go well, the public sector is not just uh, you know, uh, funding uh, the downside, but also perhaps getting a share of the upside to create a future innovation fund to start the cycle again. That's kind of a, a public venture capitalist kind of way of thinking, uh, but always opening up the space for small, medium enterprises, to enter the scenario so we don't just have the large monopolistic companies uh, getting that state support and really helping companies welcome the experimentation process that's needed. Uh, we know this from the venture capital sector for every success, there's many failures. We need to actually um, nurture a culture of experimentation and risk-taking both within business, but also within the civil service, within the state. I've set up the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose at University College London precisely to rethink the civil service and to allow it to learn through trial and error. I'm very inspired, for example, by Corfo in Chile, um, which has been thinking through uh, you know, what it means to have an innovation agency that works closely, for example, with GovLab, Laboratorio de Gobierno in Chile, which has for a long time been thinking precisely about innovation, not just through government, but within government. How do we, again, have a culture of experimentation within our civil service? And I only mention this because it's critical. 
uh, we can't have better policies around water without a stronger local administration. I have a new book coming out on what on, on the problems around outsourcing to the consulting companies. We have many governments across Latin America, Africa, and Europe, which have unfortunately decided to outsource a lot of that capacity that used to be within our public administrations to consulting companies, whether it's McKinsey, KPMG, Deloitte. We need to insource that capacity. Of course, using some consulting is fine, but in order to, to really govern our water challenges, we need new ways of thinking about the governance process itself and value creation so that government isn't there just to redistribute value, but also to co-create. And it's precisely around the co-creation side that we need to really think about innovation and industrial strategy at the center of our ability to tackle the water challenges. So it really becomes a way to think together of what the goal should be around SDG 6, which then require public and private investment and that portfolio approach and experimentation approach. Thank you very much, Professor Masukato. I just want to share before we finish that from our division, we are launching a capacity building project called ROSA, Red y Observatorio para la Sostenibilidad del Agua, with, that has the aim of enhancing the capacities of our civil servants in, ah, the, country, in the region. So we will keep in sight all of these uh, important messages you have delivered to us today to try to think in new terms, to create new incentives, new alliances and ways of cooperating in a multi-stakeholder approach with our moonshot, which is the water management transition for Latin America and the Caribbean. Thank you again for your time for sharing your knowledge with us. And we are so sure that these invaluable inputs will be so useful for the sessions and panels of our regional water dialogues. We Thank you so much. You. Yes, we look forward to seeing you in the UN Water Conference. Thank you very much. It's been an honor to speak with you.